Thanks for joining the Vietnamese webinar with VMware. Today, we are going to cover how continuous verification is an essential piece for making decisions that can help you improve the development and deployment process in your CI CD pipeline. As we go through this webinar, we encourage you to post your questions in the chat and we will answer them during the live Q&A portion at the end. Our speakers today are Matt, who is the Senior Business Development Manager at Vietnami, now part of VMware, and Bill, who is the Director of Sales Engineering and Developer Advocacy at VMware. Okay, Matt, I will let you take it from here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raquel, and thank you everybody for taking some time with us today. Uh, before I pass this over to Bill Shetty, who's going to get into the meat of today's conversation, I just wanted to set the tone uh, and provide us all a little bit of context for uh, the world that we live in, uh, in our software-defined uh, world, as well as you know where Bitnami uh, sees the world, how we see the world, uh, and what we're doing inside of VMware. Uh, so just to set the tone here, modern software continues uh, to be more complex and more decentralized. Uh, back in the early 2000s, you know, even an open source stack was relatively vertical. Uh, there weren't a lot of sources to choose from. Uh, there weren't a lot of application frameworks and runtimes to select from. Uh, and you know, choices were rather limited in the way that cloud architectures worked. Uh, now, of course, as microservices continue to proliferate and as cloud services expand what's possible, uh, our applications are far more complex. You know, furthermore, the contributors who are working on applications together, there are a lot more opinions about how good cloud outcomes should be achieved. Developers focused on the code and the configuration, security teams focused on keeping things within uh, compliance and ensuring that policies are followed, and operations teams that are dealing with resiliency and how you keep the best cloud architecture up and running. Of course, we have SecOps and DevOps and DevSecOps teams that are combining these passions in different ways. And over the years, we've built tools and pipelines and process to help us deliver to different cloud platforms. Furthermore, the sources from which we are pulling application components are also continuing to expand. And they can vary wildly in terms of trust and quality. Uh, so for example, a community source, of which there are a lot, uh, GitHub, for example, has a tremendous amount uh, of open source that you can pull from. Code snippets that you might find on Stack Overflow are another example of pulling from community sources. These sources are open, they're free, they're modular, but they may not be the most trustworthy uh, or the best maintained. Cloud sources, uh, such as quick start reference architectures from AWS, are going to be consistent and useful for working within an AWS environment. But what if you need to take that best practices uh, back to your premise-based environment, uh, or to Microsoft Azure, or to Kubernetes? Native services also comprise the different cloud sources. So you might use an RDS, uh, in AWS and a managed database in Azure. Same functionality, different API and implementation. Certified sources might include your open source foundations like the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. They don't have a commercial horse in the race per se, but they are guiding and curating your experience, uh, ensuring that you have access to trusted projects. Vendors such as Bitnami or Red Hat may also be certified sources. Uh, Bitnami can provide you a tap of pre-certified applications into your pipelines for open source componentry. You go to Red Hat to buy your operating system and they're gonna take care 
with the configuration and maintenance of that operating system baseline for you. Private sources are, of course, typically your most trustworthy, but also the most onerous to maintain. These are sources for your in-house artifacts or artifacts that have been customized by your teams. And of course, this web of dependency just continues to proliferate, and it leaves organizations with questions as to whether or not everything is consistent, secure, compliant, maintained, and is it automated to the best of its ability. And organizations have been weighing this as a balance now for some time. Developers often pining for choice and convenience and flexibility in the tools and systems and components that they use. And operations focused on resilience and security and compliance uh, with organizational or regulatory policy. And most organizations lack a unified system that really gathers what developers want and what operations wants and helps people move those applications through from a prototyping phase all the way up through staging and production. And Bitnami has been at the intersection of this world for over a decade now. Uh, prior to Bitnami's acquisition by VMware in May, uh, Bitnami provided and continues to provide a catalog of a lot of popular open source applications in cloud native ready to run formats. If you go to the AWS marketplace, the VMware cloud marketplace, the Google or the Azure cloud marketplace, and you type in a popular open source project, chances are the first or second result you'll see says certified by Bitnami. And what that means is that it's up to date and it's free of any patchable CVEs. We provide these across different formats from local uh, development environments up through cloud images and templates all the way uh, back into your data center uh, in various different formats and reference architectures. Bitnami releases over a thousand new artifacts a month uh, through our trusted software supply chain uh, and our applications are already installed over a million times per month and run over 1.5 billion operational hours per year. You can find our free community catalog uh, on all of the cloud marketplaces today, and I would invite you all to take a look. I would also let you know that if you have requirements that are not met by those artifacts, such as Redis and Node.js and Harbor on top of your own base image and instrumented with your own agents and tooling for monitoring, logging, security, and other capabilities. We should also talk about Bitnami's Project Galleon, our forthcoming offering for the enterprise, which is currently in early access beta. I look forward to speaking with you all about your open source requirements, but for now I want to transition this over to Bill Shetty. Bill, as, develop, as developer advocacy lead uh, and leader of the cloud journey team here at VMware, will share how to take these foundations and use them continuously in your CI CD pipelines. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Matt. So as Matt was reviewing, applications have gotten a lot more complex. There's a significant number of componentry components that you have to now deal with, uh, whether it's at the application level uh, layer itself, um, components like Node and Python, and, and using things like Flask uh, or Django as an example, or at the database layer, or even at the caching layer. There's just lots of different components that have to be dealt with. Applications are polyglot. So lots of different languages that are going to be utilized. And to compound that problem, you're going to potentially place some of the bits in different locations, such as in Azure, in Google, um, or AWS, depending on what the needs are going to be. And managing this complexity uh, is not getting any easier. The ability for you as a DevOps person to effectively gain some of that control is really dependent on the process that you have internally. 
Now there's a, a set of processes that are set up in general, right? Where before an application actually goes and gets deployed, you're gonna do a significant amount of checks, right? And that could be, you know, post uh, push, potentially when uh, an artifact is created and before it actually goes into, let's say, a uh, staging or a test environment or before it goes into production. And there'll be some rules and regulations as to how and what goes into a production environment. In addition, you'll do a significant number of checks potentially post deployment. However, at the end of the day, there's a lot of work that then gets done, definitely post deployment, uh, in fixing uh, issues that occur in the environment. And those issues effectively take time away from you as a DevOps person, because you're effectively going in and remediating issues that you could have potentially checked for, you could have potentially prevented um, prior to it going into either the staging or uh, dev environments or the production environments. And these checks that we do are generally done, obviously, at the end. And if we think about where we can apply now this control to improve sort of our uh, mean time, as I call it, to happy hour, right? The reduction of that remediation post deployment, it's really around the CI CD pipeline, right? And if we think about what we just reviewed and what Matt kind of went over, the application is effectively the unit of measure, right? When it comes to a multi cloud environment. And that application is controlled where? In the CI CD pipeline. So we have to effectively get better at using this as now not just the vehicle for deployment but also the vehicle to effectively go in and control the process of managing the life cycle of not just the application, but also of our environment and our processes. As I kind of mentioned, we have these checks that occur pre and post deployment. A lot of these checks, we sort of understand, you know, check for the cost of the project, the cost of the application, how much we're spending on the environment, What's the utilization currently? <clears throat> is the environment and or the application secure? Do we understand what is happening with respect to um, the, sorry about that. <clears throat> Do we understand what's happening with respect to the performance of the application? When we get information from that, we will effectively take that information and recirculate it. So it's sort of a continuous process uh, in which we effectively understand outcomes and issues, right, post deployment, and effectively reutilize that back into uh, the pipelines. Now, if we think about where and what we want to achieve, right, with the CI CD pipeline and making that effectively the main process mechanism for deployment and controlling the efficiency of our processes now, um, we want to take a look at a automotive manufacturing process, right? If you really think about the number of cars that are produced uh, out of a factory or multitudes of factories, the quality is really high. Um, those cars are coming out with a significant amount of of quality, but the process in which they go through is fairly repeatable. They're using components that they potentially borrow from other different lines, um, and production lines, and, and, and are gone through a repetitive uh, process of getting refined. We can only try to achieve software deployment and quality at this level, and that's sort of a goal, right, is to get to that level of quality from a repetitive nature. So we want it to be as high as quality as a car comes out of that car factory. But if we think of the process that an auto, as, as a car goes through that manufacturing pipeline, its efficiencies really come out because there are constant checks being done throughout that pipeline. Those checks have, are constantly also getting refined. The assembly line workers are effectively going and checking to see, hey, this sort of process is not working. 
I may not see this weld. It's not being set up correctly because of this check. We'll go back and we'll refix it. Or the check isn't actually doing something and there's a certain variance. So there's a continuous process of refining <clears throat> those components, the actual checks on those components and the process itself. And there's constant efficiencies being achieved. In this process, we want to take that sort of learning and that sort of thought process back into our software deployment. And if we apply that now to the CI CD pipeline, what we want to do is obviously from our traditional pipeline that we all understand, or based on an artifact that gets created, uh, a trigger gets uh, initiated, and then one or multiple pipelines get instantiated, we want to sort of enhance that. And how do we do it? Well, what we do is we add um, an ability to add checks, just like in an automotive uh, uh, production line. And those checks can be anything that you deem as necessary. There's no right or wrong answer here, right? And so what I call this is extending that pipeline out. So during the CD portion of our CI CD pipeline, we want to make specific checks like budget checks or compliance checks. And we're gonna do that either through some manual scripts or potentially in most cases through connections to what we call external actors. And those external actors are systems that we have either built or purchased off the shelf um, or could be some sort of a, a uh, a third party SaaS tool itself. And that process of extending the pipeline is what we call continuous verification, right? And so if we think about this now, it, it is really a very simple process of uh, taking um, components and systems that we understand that help give us answers for efficiencies that are occurring inside um, of our processes and understanding where there could be errors and problems and bringing some of that information back into the CD process and continuously refining it. So the process of creating those external systems and then continuously using that information is the process of continuous verification. And at the end of this, right, what it really boils down to is that you are going to enable yourself to have more time uh, to do other things and concentrate on your business. Okay, time to relax, uh, but also have an ability to actually innovate and kind of move forward instead of spending a significant amount of time trying to remediate and trying to fix potential issues. Now, what are some of those external actors and components that we can um, potentially use, right, in the process of continuous verification? So, the categories here on the left, right, are just a, a sampling of what at least I think of, right, based on some of the products we have at VMware, but there could be more, hence the et cetera at the bottom. Um, and again, there's no right or wrong answer here of what the categories could be. But in each category, there's different sort of examples that you can pick from. So let's take the first one, which is cost and utilization. There's significant tools out there, right, that can be used to understand the cost utilization of your deployment, your environment, your application, the services that are being used, et cetera. There's tools around compliance, right, um, <clears throat> that indicate whether you're HIPAA, CI, PCI, or whether you have certain governance rules set up, whether or not there's compliance there. I want to do some sort of security component also here, such as image security, right? I wanna ensure that the uh, user and or the project has certain authorization and access rules uh, into let's say the services that it may be using on Amazon or util uh, an ability for different components to talk to each other. I wanna check the performance and how well that performance is doing. And hence there's a myriad of off the shelf tools and retail or even open source components that you can use um, to better uh, to help enable you to get better information about what's happening. Now in this webinar, we're gonna talk specifically about um, <clears throat> the VMware-based ones. So for cost and utilization, there's Cloud Health by VMware, which gives you the information on Amazon, Azure, and Google. 
uh, and about your application in Kubernetes and how well that's being used. We will talk about compliance in secure state. Uh, that helps understand um, how well you are doing from a compliance perspective on the public cloud for your application. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, image verification through use of Claire, which our Harbor project uh, also uses, that's our registry. And then we'll talk a little bit about performance detection uh, through a product called Wavefront, which helps you analyze performance or metrics effectively in your application and in your environment, whether it's on public cloud, on-prem, or on Kubernetes. So I'm gonna go into a demo at this point. And in order to do that, <clears throat> We've built an application uh, that would we'll use to demonstrate um, continuous verification. And the application that we've built is a e-commerce site. It's called um, Acme Shop. And it is a full uh, e-commerce website that allows you to buy fitness components, products, has a front end, user service, catalog, cart, order and a payment service, all written in different languages, right, in Go, Python, and Node, and also utilizing uh, several different types of databases, Redis and Mongo in this case. And of course, all the images uh, that we're using, the baseline images um, for Go and Python and Node, uh, and for Mongo and Redis are all based on verified Bitnami images, right? Uh, and that's important because Bitnami provides us with a curated uh, set of components that we don't have to worry about from a uh, CVE perspective or a, or a uh, or image verification issues. We know that they're up to date with the latest updates. And so this app is what I'll use uh, as part of the demo. So let's just you know, switch over here. So let's just switch over to the demo. Let's take a look at the app. This is the app. It is a real app, okay? You come in and effectively log in um, and actually, let me just log in. And I can go shopping at this point in time. I can add, I don't know, a bike to the cart take a look at my car, I can change it, and proceed to check out, and kind of go through it. Um, now some of the components in here we've actually developed, others we've actually deployed using cube apps, right, from Bitnami. Uh, in particular, MongoDB, right, <laughs> we've actually deployed that inside of the cluster on Amazon, um, in which some of the components like the catalog service uh, and the order service are talking to. So what we've done with this application and how we've added continuous verification into it is best viewed here inside of our CI-CD pipeline. And now we've used GitLab uh, as our CI-CD pipeline tool. And in order to deploy this, we obviously would go in and we've made some, we made changes and or we've developed the different components from cart all the way to user. And it goes through a standard build phase. Once that build phase kind of completes and the artifacts are created, we'll go through a set of scans and check for issues on the images. And there we're using Claire to effectively go in and double check whether or not there's significant issues. Um, and you can see that there's, it's run through a, a certain number of checks. We can go in and double check what we're, what's allowable, what's not allowable on, on some of those images. And before we actually take now the actual application of the entire e-commerce site and deploy it for testing onto a staging cluster that we've put in on Amazon, we actually do what we call a governance check. That governance check is composed of two components. One is a budget check, another is what's called a security check. And these are simple checks that <clears throat> are based off of some policy that we've set up We'll take a look at the budget for a second. The budget check actually goes into uh, Cloud Health as a tool and checks based on a 
budget here where we have, and you can see this, and I can highlight it, it says that my stretch is 4,000, but the limit is three. So somewhere with, I'm within this range, or let's say I'm over $4,000 to spend, then I'm over. And what, can, what this check is gonna do is stop that CD or that deployment cold, and effectively say, go back to your um, operations person and ask for more budget because you don't have enough capacity left before um, you can deploy anything more, even in staging. And what this check actually does is it goes into a tool that we have called Cloud Health. Cloud Health provides me with an ability to see all of my costs um, across all of my clouds. Uh, On-prem, Azure, Google, helps me cut that down by all the different services, right? Here you can see how much we're spending across all the different months on EC2, on Redshift, EKS, et cetera. And in my specific case, and in this specific case, what we've done is we've actually gone through and added in uh, certain capabilities um, to actually get an understanding of what's happening on our Kubernetes clusters and double checked and made sure that the cost uh, on those clusters uh, isn't overrun. You can see here on my EKS cluster that I'm using, it's got 24 pods and three namespaces and nodes but I can actually go in and take a look at some of the resources that are being utilized and how well those resources are being utilized uh, on the cluster. I can go into an allocation mechanism and I can see all the different namespaces that are being used and I can understand how much CPU is utilized on a per namespace basis. And finally, I can go in and take a look at the cost history. And this is effectively what that check on GitLab is doing. Um, with the cost check under governance, it's coming in and checking whether or not I've over my budget by checking this report uh, for that specific cluster, right? Which is assigned to a project. Um, and once I do that uh, cost check and assume it, it says yes, I also go in and do what we call a security check. And the security check <clears throat> goes into the environments that I will be using for this project in this specific case, goes into the uh, Amazon EKS cluster and checks if there's any violations. Now it, it actually finds a violation, right? Uh, but we reverse the logic here. We've put one in on purpose to highlight it and <clears throat> we'll proceed. But in general, you'll wanna fail uh, based on the violation that's found. And then you would stop and have someone check the environment and ensure that there's no issues. Now the check that we did here is uh, using a uh, product that we have in VMware called VMware Secure State. What Secure State does is it has an entire mapping of all the objects that are in Amazon and Azure, all the relationships between those objects. It tracks every single delta change that's occurring on those objects and those changes are compared against a set of rules that I have, which then indicate how many violations I have against those rules. Here's a dashboard <laughs> showing all the different violations and the violating rules that I have. Now, I can look at it from a dashboard perspective, or I can actually go in and drill down and take a look at each one of the, uh, the, the violations by rule. I can uh, <clears throat> do, um, some more filtering. Uh, you can see here that there's 13 violations on, on this one. And it says an EC2 instance has port 22 accessible from a public address. And the interesting thing here is that not only can I see that rule, but I can go and take a look at the object and all the different components that are surrounding it. Let's just zoom in for a little bit here. And you can see here's the instance. I get an information about the instance. I also get information about other objects such as uh, the IP table rules or the route tables and the gateways that are associated with it or the subnets and all the different tags that are associated with it. Hence, so I have an entire mapping of that information. Um, to give you a little bit more uh, of insight into this, I'm going to actually take a look at that cluster that uh, we brought up. Um, and I'll uh, show you it uh, running over here. And we'll just add that. Give it a second. 
Sorry about that. I think I'm having a small issue here, but we can bring this up. There we go. And so what I've actually done is I've searched my object uh, database and found the actual bits of that cluster. Now, if I go look at Amazon as an example, as my staging cluster, I see there's a specific VPC. And that's the VPC that I just brought up, all the different subnets in it. The cool thing about Secure State, and, and the reason this is important in your CI CD pipeline is because not only will I see, let's say, the bits around that cluster, but I can also get information about all the different instances that are attached to that cluster. Hence, when I want to do a security check against an endpoint, Secure State actually gives me the most detailed information because it will have that entire object map and all the different violations that are occurring uh, for the objects associated with that environment. And in this case, we are doing a security check around an EKS cluster. Now, once I finish this security check, um, and assuming it is all passed, I'll go to the deployment stage where I'm actually going and deploying onto the cluster itself. And you can see that we've done a, a full deploy, right, onto uh, the staging cluster that I just checked on. Um, and then I'm going to do a traffic, a little bit of traffic generation, and I'm loading the locust into here. And I'll use another tool from, Wave, uh, from VMware called Wavefront. And Wavefront allows me to now check on the performance of my um, Acme Fitness Shop running in this, uh, in this, this staging cluster. And what we do is we check, we're doing a specific check. In this case, we're checking for, let's say, CPU utilization, right, on that cluster on a, at a specific rate, but whether or not it's exceeding some allowable uh, capacity. And Wavefront's a really, um, uh, <clears throat> it, is a, it is a metrics analysis tool that allows me to aggregate a lot of information. In this case, I'm showing you just about Kubernetes clusters, but it allows me to aggregate basically metrics information about pretty much anything from my application to Amazon and obviously to or Azure or Google or the environments or vSphere or even Kubernetes clusters. And in this situation, uh, we're looking at that EKS cluster that um, I'm using in staging. You can see all the different bits and, and components that are associated to with it. I have lots of different metrics that are coming in from it. And in particular, right, I am actually trying to look at the average in, uh, of a rate, a specific rate for the CPU utilization across the pod. And this is the, this is the actual uh, metric that we're pulling on. And you can see here all the different bits. You can see my order service carts and, and catalog components all running up here. Um, and then <clears throat> we run an analysis and we make sure that it passes the allowable capacity or it's below the thresholds that we set, and it succeeds, as you can see here. And once that's finished, uh, we'll then go in and deploy the cluster into a production environment. And so hopefully uh, this quick walkthrough, right, of a sample pipeline and some sample checks that we've done gives you an idea of some of the things that you can do inside of your CD pipeline in enhancing the actual process of ensuring that you have a much more efficient and effective deployment and reducing some of that remediation work that you're going to do um, post deployment. So let's just review what we showed. Uh, let me get back into um, to PowerPoint. There we go. So what I showed you was <clears throat> in the example scenario was uh, a full pipeline where we've done a vulnerability check. We've done a governance check where we've checked on the capacity and the budget uh, for that project and that account. Uh, we've also checked for security, right? And we've also done a performance check. Now we've placed these checks in specific locations where we thought it was necessary, where you place your checks and what tools you use, that is up to you. Ideally, hopefully, we'll use some of the tools that I just showed you from VMware, like Cloud Health, Secure State, and Wavefront. <clears throat> but in reality, that process of what you choose, where you put it, is up to you 
uh, and based on the process that you've put in place for deployments and your business requirements. But at the end of the day, um, the, important, uh, the important thing to understand here is that it's not just setting up those rules or the, those checks on, uh, and understanding what the checks are, but it's also understanding the parameters behind those checks. You know, I call those parameters and, and the components behind those checks fences and gates. And it's effectively, I guess, in a better way to say this, it's a set of guardrails that you would utilize to effectively understand on a regular basis uh, where your limits are, right? From a, from a uh, performance or from a security perspective um, uh, or from a cost and a resource utilization perspective, right? And, you know, the sky's the limit here. But understanding those guardrails you would also put those down into let's say JSON files or something that you would constantly check on, continuously change, and then, and then iterate as needed as your requirements change over time. So these fences and gates are also very important to understand and keep track of on a regular basis. They're effectively the, you know, the, the, the brains behind continuous verification. So regardless of where you put stuff, right, having the right fences and gates and having the right rules, we call it policies for lack of a better term, is important. Um, and then managing those policies on a regular basis is ideal. Uh, you know, we've implemented it, as you saw in the pipeline, with either a flat files or with Docker containers that we can constantly push. So that when the dev, when DevOps is, is going down and actually or developers are trying to roll this into staging or production, you don't have to worry about uh, managing that deployment. The checks are already added in to ensure that you, that <clears throat> um, if a violation is found, you are alerted immediately. And if you see changes, you change the fences and gates, you change those rules and push them back out to those locations, modifying the containers that are doing the checks or the, the scripts. And, you spend less time actually worrying about their, the CD environments. So in short, you know, what we've reviewed is hopefully you know, giving you a good picture of continuous verification from end to end um, and showing you how to effectively shift left from your day two based operational components back into your CD pieces. So all the items in purple on this graph here are things that you can effectively add uh, manually uh, based on what you need into your uh, process. And hopefully that'll help reduce your time that you're gonna be spending on issues and remediation post deployment. And obviously we'd love you for you to use some of the components from VMware that can help you achieve this like Bitnami for the images, for the deployment of some of the components, right? <clears throat> and for the curated items, uh, Cloud Health for some of your cost verifications, not just from day two, but also from um, inside through the APIs, Secure State for security and violations, uh, and Wavefront for performance checks, et cetera. Uh, and hopefully you can, you also get a chance to use our cloud automation services to be able to you know, help support that from, let's say, an end-to-end -end, uh, perspective. So hopefully we've given you a good idea of what continuous verification is, what some of the components around, uh, uh, the complexities around applications are. And, um, you know, I think we're, we're kind of at a point where we can take some questions at this point. Thank you very much, Matt and Bill, for that great presentation. Well, now we will move to some lead uh, questions and answers from the audience. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, post them in the chat and we will answer them now. Here are some questions that came in during the, the presentation. Well, uh, someone asked, how do I make modification to Bitnami applications? I think Matt, that you can answer this, this question. Thanks, Raquel, and a great question. So 
Bitnami images are free to consume, uh, and they're originally configured with Bitnami's same default specifications. Uh, you are welcome to use those turnkey, or as Bill showed, you can use the CICD pipeline uh, to add in additional elements uh, and configuration parameters. Uh, how you do that will depend on what image type uh, and what tooling and process that you have in place uh, to make changes to things today. Uh, but the best advice is, you know, use the foundation uh, and modify from there. That being said, uh, Bitnami is also uh, accepting early access customers for Project Galleon, uh, which is our curated selection of applications uh, that we send to the various public cloud marketplaces tuned to your specifications and pre-configured or pre-customized uh, and ready to deliver uh, directly into your private image registries and repositories. So if you would like Bitnami's managed supply chain to simply deliver images that are already pre-customized so your teams can use them, uh, please do get in touch at that email address on the screen, uh, enterprise at bitnami.com. We would love to talk to you about that. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. Well, we have uh, another question. Uh, does this process also include a unit test, integration test? Other those are only continuous integration. I think, Bill, that you can answer this. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, so the, the continuous verification part is really centered around CD, right? Or the continuous deployment aspects. And the reason for this is that when we talk, and you know, most, most of you out there probably heard about this concept called shift left. And when we talk about shift left, we talk about the developers actually taking a lot more and a significant amount of the burden than doing testing the question <clears throat> obviously is so in CI right and the ability of it to get those artifacts you're going to do is like SAS and DAST and other sorts of tests and functional tests that are necessary but that's all fairly standard that's out there and you know a lot of businesses and, and, and a lot line of businesses and projects do that on a normal basis and that should be just good hygiene that's out there um, <clears throat> you know uh, taking a lot more, a little bit more of the burden on from a test case perspective, let's say into the, 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 the staging and, and the dev environment, it, it, it's part of shift left. But what's generally forgotten is to do some of these tests in the CD piece, such as the security checks or the cost check, et cetera. And that's what we're trying to highlight here. Uh, not to say that none of the other testing environments are not needed, but those are generally already there and in process. And we're just enhancing the process now of adding those, those extra checks that most people think about in day two, but now we're saying add those into the CD portion um, to in, in, in enhance that aspect of it. Thank you, Bill. And there is another question for you, Matt. Uh, someone how can I use Vietnami to create an e-commerce website? Yeah, great question. Uh, thanks uh, for asking that. Uh, there are several turnkey e-commerce solutions uh, that are available, uh, such as Magento uh, and a few others that you can find on the bitnami.com slash stacks webpage. Uh, take a look at that and find out uh, if there's something that, uh, that we have out of the box for you. Uh, other than that, uh, you can certainly use the component pieces that you will find there. Uh, as Bill showed today, you know, leveraging foundations like a Node.js uh, baseline configuration or a uh, Cassandra database or a MongoDB database on the back end if you're building your own application. Uh, that being said, uh, there are, as I said, reference architectures for popular uh, e-commerce stacks that are available today. So please do check out that out at that uh, at that web page there, bitnami.com slash stacks. Thank you, Matt, for this information. There is another great question. 
how hard is to get adoption in micro for continuous verification? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so <laughs> it really develop, de depends on the business itself, communication aspects between DevOps, cloud ops, and the developers, right? Um, I mean, it's a process. I'm not going to say that I think uh, adoption of this internally is going to go overnight. Um, you know, from some of the discussions that we've had with a lot of our customers um, is that they want to add this. Uh, obviously, security groups and the, and the DevOps groups want to add this in. Um, but it's a process, right? So I think the best advice here is to try it out on a couple of small uh, projects first see how well it goes um, and then show the results back upstream and see if we, a larger process can be built to effectively go uh, mandate in, 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 in other parts, maybe then you know, the entire line of business and then so on and so forth. So it, it, it takes time, right? Um, and it, it, it will also um, help you learn about your business, about what's important. Uh, from an aspects perspective and, the, and not just security, but from a cost utilization and, and other us components and then even refine your own process. Um, so I, I would say that it, it, it's a, it's a, it's a step-by-step -step process to get it done. Uh, in some cases um, you may already have the bits that people are just not have exposed. Um, in other cases, you're starting from ground up, but um but I, I think you can eventually get there. I think once, as we have seen it, I'm talking to a lot of our customers, they definitely want to go down that path. Um, what I will tell you is that a lot of the public cloud customers that are tens of thousands or 70%, 80% in public cloud use this process that I just mentioned of continuous verification. But it's taken them years to get there across the entire organization, right? Um, you know, there, you were talking, you know, 80 to 70,000 instances into Amazon or Azure, et cetera. So it's viable, it, it's doable. Um, it's a step-by-step -step process. So hopefully that helps. Thank you. Do we have more time for a other question, Bill? Uh, yeah, we can maybe take one or two more. Okay, perfect, yeah. Uh, there's another question uh, saying, uh, does this, continuum, this continuous verification links in any way to continuous authentication? Uh, it's a part of it. I think if you look at the slides that we have, <clears throat> there's different aspects of continuous verification. Um, we use the term continuous verification to subsume lots of categories, right? Uh, those categories include authorization, right? Uh, and authentication itself has to occur, and that should be kind of, we'd assume, just good hygiene inside of the process, right? Uh, but there's different, you know, so I, I wouldn't preclude it. I think that's a choice. Um, the categories that we went over are not... Uh, complete by any means, right? There's more to it. And I only mentioned authorization, but yes, authentication is part of it. Um, continuous security itself, you know, as, as, as a broader component has lots of different bits in it. So it's really your choice as to what sort of checks you add into here, right? Um, and it's flexible, right? Uh, it's a framework for you to utilize. So authentication is part of it. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I would say that um, there's nothing specific uh, that we would mandate right now as part of it, uh, except make sure you have your right uh, authentication into Amazon or Azure and, and other places that you need to and make sure that's part of this process. Yeah. Next. Next, next uh, question is, um, how is a continuous verification different than C left, which everyone is talking about? Yeah, I think I, <laughs> I, think I just answered that in the previous question. Um, so again, shift left that everybody's talking about really pertains to, to 
paying the developers to have more uh, a burden of actually doing the testing, right? And a lot of times shift left specifically talks about security aspects and it talks about uh, doing those functional tests and doing the security checks and the image verifications. And it's usually uh, targeted at the developers, but it misses the points that we talked about, which are centered around environment security, which are centered around the cost, the performance of the environment or the cost of the project per se. So it misses a lot of that. And in a lot of, in some cases, or majority of the cases that you read out there on the web, that shift left will basically hit the CI portion, right? Uh, and minimally the CD, but it's, you know, what we've done with continuous verification is saying, look, it, this is really adding into, let's say that CD portion, right? At the end of the day, all of the stuff around uh, shift left is part of it. Um, but again, as I repeated in the, in the previous in the previous answer, it, it should be just good hygiene. It's, it's sort of there. So this is an add-on to what people are talking about as shift left in sort of completing that picture. Thank you. We have here a, a short question for Matt. Can I use Vietnamese applications for free? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Uh, Bitnami's community catalog there, uh, which you can find in all of the public cloud marketplaces, AWS, Azure, Google, Oracle, uh, and others, uh, is available for free. Uh, take a look there uh, or go to bitnami.com slash stacks uh, and get pointed in the right direction to the right marketplace to find the format and application that you need. Yes, and besides the, the text that you saw in this presentation, what are some other texts that uh, we can do for continuous verification? Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, so we showed just three, right? But I, I think a, a real big one that, that definitely has to be added into this that we didn't show as an example is authorization um, into Amazon or Azure. Mm -hmm. uh, think about like service principles and making sure that some of the bits that are going in actually have access and are authorization to, to run. Um, you know, if, if I had built this application to actually go in um, and use some services, which you can, let's say if you go into scale, you'd use a fully managed database versus a self, uh, self-managed database. You probably use something like an RDS um, or, you know, in Azure, you might use Cosmos DB or the Postgres instance, right? In those cases, you know, the application is going to get deployed. One of the things you want to do is do an authorization check. Hey, make sure that A, either the project <clears throat> has access to this, make sure that the, um, the services themselves are configured in a way that they have the right authorization bits to go and talk to that service on the other side. So that's just another example of another CV check that you can do um, that we didn't uh, cover in here. Um, but, but sort of the, the, the sky's the limit, right? Um, uh, there, there's various different iterations that, that you can go through. It really depends on wh what you think you want to minimize uh, or, or help prevent uh, from occurring uh, as issues later on. Thank you very much, Bill. Well, thank you again to everyone who joined. We will be following up with a recording to this webinar via email shortly. Have a great day. Bye.